from, uh, most recently from North Carolina, and I'm here for the big day on Saturday. And uh, I appreciate your invitation uh, to speak with you this evening. Um, when I was in England, uh, I basically uh, had many occasions to speak out on LGBT issues, and so uh, this was one of the things I was provoked to um, reflect on uh, while I was there um, um, in England. So I called the, the uh, talk Sex and the Sins of the Fathers, Fertility, Religion, and Human Rights. So I begin with a quote from Bishop Jean Robinson, who is the uh, a couple of gay men who was elected Bishop of New Hampshire. And uh, I'm happy to say, I'm very proud to say that I, uh, we now have another couple, of, uh, we have a couple of lesbian bishops in Los Angeles, which is my home diocese. And I'm happy to say I was able, upon my return uh, to LA, to vote for her on her ballot. And she's, she's great. Anyway. This quote is from Jean Robinson, and Jean Robinson said, um, the biggest obstacle to LGBT rights is the Abrahamic religions. That is to say, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. The biggest obstacle to human rights for, L for LGBT persons is um, the Abrahamic faiths. Um, so I don't, I don't wish to speak for Judaism or Islam because I don't know enough about those faiths and the cultural context in which they operate. But I do wish to speak for Christianity and I think that um, uh, one can see his point. I'm sure that you can tell stories too. But let me just begin with a couple of examples that uh, struck my, um, came to my attention. So the first one um, was in Vatican pronouncements about LGBT issues can find these documents on the Vatican website. There are lots of documents about these issues. And uh, the Vatican's um, position about uh, LGBT and human rights is um, it puts them on the spot because post-Vatican II, um, the Roman Catholic Church is very proud of having developed a social justice uh, emphasis. And they have done lots of wonderful things in advocating uh, for the poor, uh, poor nations around the world, and also uh, for peace, uh, that, that powerful nations should use their power to wage peace instead of war, and so on and so on. So they, they, they have uh, been advocates for human rights when it comes to poverty and when it comes to war and peace issues. So having that human rights emphasis, you might think that would go into other areas of ethical dispute, but uh, LGBT issues are places where they um, have it difficult, right? So, so they, so they want to. They don't want to say that we deny LGBT people human rights um, because that's contrary to their social justice teaching. But on the other hand, um, they are really totally opposed to LGBT lifestyles, right? So they try to deal with this uh, by making a pair of distinctions. First, they distinguish between the homosexual condition, which they think is deformed, but not a sin, right? And homosexual activity, which is a grave, in my day we used to say, mortal sin, right? Um, so they make that distinction, first of all. Uh, we've heard this before. Um, and. Um, Yes, it's bad every time. So, um, so they make that distinction. And then they make a distinction with, re with respect to the state. Uh, they want to say that there's a distinction between the state respecting the human rights of individual LGBT persons, qua individual persons, right? Because they're committed by their social justice teaching to respect the, the human rights of every human. Person, um, and what the state should do by way of creating institutions to house LGBT lifestyles. And so they want to say, well, the state, they, they reluctantly concede, and um, if I were reading the paper, I would give you a bunch of quotes, but, but, uh, but you can go check it, out, check it out for yourself, believe me, I'm not making this up, right? Um, um, they, they, they reluctantly say, that well, the state does have, should tolerate 
people doing morally wrong things in private context. And therefore, they should tolerate LGBT activity um, in private. Right? So they have to respect the right of human beings to behave that way in private. But it's an entirely different matter when it comes to the state passing laws that would establish institutional structures that would house LGBT, LGBT lifestyles. And it's part of the Vatican's position that it's the duty of every Roman Catholic legislator or government official who has, a, have, has power to affect these things uh, to vote against, or if it's already passed, to try to repeal any institutional housing that the state has created for those, for those um, lifestyles. And their argument goes as follows. They say that a lifestyle or um, practice should be institutional, legally institutionalized, only if it promotes the common good. Now guess what? Uh, heterosexual marriage and the family promote the common good. And therefore, it should have um, institutional housing, legally established institutional housing with protections and rights and so on and so forth. Um, because it does society so much good. And of course, the institution of heterosexual marriage does provide a service for society because it houses much of the sexual activity that reproduces the next generation, which keeps the society going. So that is a service that has been provided by this institution, right? Um, um, so it does promote the common good if, if you think it's good for the human, human race to go on. Um, but they conclude that, therefore, um, uh, so it should be institutionalized, and of course it is institutionalized, and so Roman Catholic legislators should uphold that institution. But they think that were LGBT lifestyles to receive institutional housing, um, as would happen if there were LGBT, gay and lesbian marriage um, um, possibilities, then, um, then this would be, or, or if there were to be institutions for what we used to call in the olden days uh, in the state's common law marriage, they call them de facto relationships, right? Then um, uh, that basically this would, these competitive, these, these other lifestyles would compete with marriage and therefore would undermine heterosexual marriage and anything that undermines the common good should not receive legal housing or legal protection. This is their argument. Okay, and so they conclude that, uh, that, it's, that, that while the state should respect the rights, but the right of individuals to do bad things in private so long, you know, uh, it, they should not respect the right, they should not, they should not respect the lifestyle to the degree of creating uh, laws and so on that would, that would institution house um, the lifestyle. So that's the Roman Catholic example, but you know, repentance begins at home, so let me take an Anglican example, since I'm an Anglican. Um, so uh, Andrew Goddard and Ephraim Radner uh, on the website, the evangelical um, Anglican website called Fulcrum, uh, you can find it on the web, um, they produce many papers, but one of the papers they produced was in response to the Nigerian criminalization of homosexual activity. Now the criminalization in, in Nigeria was particularly um, egregious insofar as um, it wasn't just that um, um, homosexual activity was criminalized, right? But if, if a couple of guys had dinner together, you know, you could be arrested because, hey, I'll come here having dinner with a guy. Or a couple of girls were probably less apt to be arrested because it's the way those things work out, right? But um, so, so lots of things were criminalized. And of course, clergy who might, you know, uh, aid and abet, um, LGBT partnerships uh, could be um, jailed and so on. So the idea was they, they passed laws uh, which, which uh, imposed a penalty of 14 years in jail for people who uh, were homosexual partners, 